Hey everyone, and welcome back to The Deep Dive. You know those late night what if thoughts that keep you up? Yeah. And well, that's what we're diving into today. Nice. We're tackling Nick Bostrom's deep utopia. And it's not your typical utopia mm -hmm. with like flying cars and endless pizza. Right. Bostrom drops us into a world where technology solves everything. Yeah. And then asks, okay, now what? Right, right. If you love mind-blowing deep dives like this one, be sure to hit that like button and subscribe for more. Definitely. But for now, strap in because things are about to get philosophical. Absolutely. So you ready to explore a future where robots do the dishes and ponder the meaning of life? I'm ready. Let's go. Bostrom paints this picture of what he calls technological maturity. Okay. A world where we've basically mastered engineering and can satisfy any material need. Think Star Trek replicators. Yeah. But for everything. Okay, so that sounds kind of like paradise. Right. Sign me up for that timeshare on Mars. <laughs> but I'm guessing there's a catch. There is. Bostrom wouldn't be Bostrom if he yeah. didn't throw in a good existential crisis. Exactly. Right? It's a big one. He argues that this abundance, this world without struggle, mm. could actually lead to human redundancy. What do you mean? We become like that bug with an exoskeleton that Bostrom talks about. Right. The exoskeleton is great for support, but remove it. Mm hmm and you've got this shapeless blob that can't function on its own. Okay, I see. So Bostrom's arguing that the struggles of life, the need to work and strive, actually give us shape and purpose. But no struggle, no purpose. Right. That's kind of a downer, isn't it? Yeah. Wouldn't the life of leisure be, well, leisurely? You'd think so, but that's where it gets really interesting. Oh, okay. The economics of utopia are trickier than we might imagine. Remember economist John Maynard Keynes? Yeah, vaguely. He predicted we'd all be working 15-hour weeks by now, thanks to technology. Yeah, that didn't quite work out that way, did it? No. I can barely keep up with my inbox as it is. Exactly. Keynes missed a few key factors. First, as we get wealthier... We tend to invent new things to desire. Yeah. A century ago, a smartphone was science fiction. Right. Now we panic if we misplace it for five minutes. Totally. And these new desires, they're often pricey. Right. Plus, even with robots building everything, some things are just inherently scarce. Like, oh, I don't know, that beachfront property in the Bahamas I've been eyeing. Yeah, exactly. Those are what economists call positional goods, things that are valuable because they're limited. A rare scamp, mm -hmm. a first edition book, yeah. a concert ticket. <laughs> even with robots doing the work, people will still compete for those, driving up costs and potentially even sparking conflict. Okay, so utopia might be expensive, ain't he competitive? It could be. Anything else I should be worried about? Robot uprising, maybe? Well, Bostrom does touch on a sobering concept, the Malthusian trap. Mm -hmm. It's the idea that yeah. even with robots in abundance, population growth could outpace resource production, mm -hmm. driving average well-being back down. Imagine a world where everyone can have as many kids as they want. No one needs to work. Right. right. But there's only so much land and food to go around. That's the That's, trap. Hold on. Even with robots making food and stuff, it, mm -hmm. it seems like technology could find solutions for that. Maybe vertical farms or lab-grown meat or even, you know, colonizing other planets. You're thinking like a true utopian. And those solutions might buy us time. Okay. But the Malthusian trap highlights a fundamental tension. Unchecked growth, even in a technologically advanced society, right. can have unintended consequences. Yeah. It's something to keep in mind as we grapple with issues like resource scarcity mm. and environmental sustainability today. Okay, so utopia is starting to sound less like a beach vacation <laughs> right? and more like a complex economic puzzle. Yeah. But we're not just here to talk about robot-made goods and population numbers, right? Yeah. Bostrom digs into the philosophical side of things too, doesn't he? Absolutely. This whole purpose problem you mentioned earlier. Yes. He argues that a world without struggle could lead to this really deep sense of purposelessness. And it's not just about work. He distinguishes between, you know, subjective boredom, yeah. that temporary feeling of, oh, I'm so bored, right. and something called objective boringness. Okay, now you've officially got me curious. Yeah. Objective boringness. Yeah. What is that exactly? So imagine someone who finds endless fascination in like sorting grains of sand by color. Okay. To them, it's stimulating, maybe even beautiful. But for most of us, yeah. objectively boring, it's repetitive, it doesn't really lead anywhere, right. it doesn't fulfill any deeper human need. I think I see where you're going with this. Yeah. So even if technology could zap away our like, ugh, I'm bored moments, mm -hmm. 
we might still be left with lives that feel fundamentally pointless. Exactly. And that's a challenge no robot can solve for us. It's a question of what makes life meaningful in the first place. Wow, things just got real deep real fast. I need a minute to process all this, but I have a feeling this is just the tip of the iceberg. What other mind-bending concepts does Bostrom have in store for us? Well, we've only just scratched the surface. Buckle up, because ah. next we're going to explore the moral and even metaphysical limitations of utopia. Okay. And trust me, it's going to challenge everything you thought you knew about a perfect world. Welcome back to the deep dive. We're exploring what a utopia powered by technological maturity might really look like. Mm -hmm. You know drawing from Nick Bostrom's deep utopia. Yeah, last time we were definitely wading into some deep existential waters. Right. Especially with that idea of objective boredom. It's like, even if technology could zap away our everyday boredom, yeah. we could still end up with lives that feel inherently pointless. It's a troubling thought, isn't it? Yeah. And Bostrom doesn't stop there. He goes on to argue that there might be moral and metaphysical limits on oh, what no. we can achieve, even in a utopia, okay. with seemingly limitless technological power. Wait. Moral limits in utopia? I thought the whole point of utopia was that it was morally perfect. Mm. You know, no crime, no poverty. Everyone's enlightened and living their best life. Right. That's the classic image. Right. But Bostrom pushes us to think deeper. What if, for example, we had the technology to create sentient beings? Okay. Just to cater to our desires. Like what? We could have virtual companions, perfect servants, even entire simulated worlds full of beings designed to entertain us. I mean, that's starting to sound less like utopia and more like, well, a really advanced form of exploitation. Right. Would those beings even have rights? Would we even care? Those are precisely the ethical dilemmas Bostrom wants us to confront. Yeah. Would creating beings solely for our amusement, would that give our lives meaning? Or would it just be a more sophisticated way of dodging our own existential questions? It gets to the heart of what it means to be moral, not just in a technologically advanced society, but as human beings. Okay, so it's almost like having all this power, all this freedom, right. could make us even more ethically lost if we're not careful. Exactly. And even if we figure out the morality of artificial life, mm -hmm. there's still the potential for conflict in utopia, right? Right. I mean, human nature doesn't just disappear because we have a robot butler. Right. Resources might be abundant, but things like power, status, and influence, yeah. those are always limited. Even in a technologically advanced society, there will be those who seek to control others, mm -hmm. impose their will, or just stand out from the crowd. So utopia is not necessarily a guarantee of peace and harmony? It might not be. My dream of living in a peaceful robot-maintained commune might be a bit naive. Perhaps, but it's important oh. to remember that utopia isn't like a fixed destination. It's an ongoing process. Okay. Even with incredible technology, we'd still be grappling with the same fundamental human challenges, the desire for power, mm -hmm. the fear of death, the search for meaning. Okay, I'm officially starting to rethink my retirement plans for utopia. <laughs> it's sounding less like paradise Christ. and more like a really, really complicated social experiment. But there's more, isn't there? There is. Bostrom also talks about metaphysical limits. Yes. I'm not even sure I know what that means in this context. It's one of the most mind-blowing parts of deep utopia. Bostrom reminds us that even with advanced technology, we're still bound by the laws of physics. Yeah. The speed of light, the size of minds, the potential existence of other civilizations. Right. All of these things could impose hard limits on what's possible, Yeah. even in a utopia where we've seemingly conquered every earthly limitation. So no matter how advanced we get, yeah. we might never be able to travel faster than light or download our consciousness into a supercomputer or even like fully understand the vastness of the universe. Those are questions that still baffle scientists and philosophers today. Yeah. And they'd likely continue to do so even in a technologically advanced future. Okay. It's humbling in a way. Mm. Our ingenuity might be boundless, but the universe itself might impose constraints that we can never overcome. Yeah, it makes you realize that maybe utopia isn't just about achieving a perfect state, but about embracing the mystery mm -hmm. and the unknown, right. even as we push the boundaries of what's possible. That's a great insight. And it leads us to one of the most profound and unsettling questions Bostrom raises. Okay. The question of significance. Significance. I mean, isn't utopia all about maximizing happiness and well-being, wouldn't that make our lives pretty significant? It's a natural assumption. But Bostrom suggests that in a world where all our needs are met, mm. where we no longer face real challenges or struggle, okay. 
life might start to feel insignificant. Wait, how could that be? If we're healthy, happy, and living in a technologically advanced paradise, wouldn't that be the most significant thing ever? Think about it this way. If everything is achievable, okay. if our actions have no real consequences, mm -hmm. what's the point of striving for anything? Yeah. What makes our lives matter in the grand scheme of things? Okay. That's the challenge Bostrom wants us to confront. Whoa. It's like we're trading one set of problems for another. Instead of worrying about survival, we're wrestling with the meaning of existence itself. It's a pretty heavy thought. It is. But I guess that's what makes Deep Utopia so fascinating. Right. It forces us to think about the big picture. Yeah. The really big picture. Exactly. And Bostrom doesn't leave us hanging with these unsettling questions. Okay, good. He offers some potential solutions. Okay. Some ways to find meaning and purpose, even in a world of abundance and vast cosmic indifference. But to understand those solutions, we first need to grasp one of his most intriguing and mind-boggling concepts. The big world hypothesis. Ooh, I love a good hypothesis. Hit me with it. What's this big world all about? So imagine a universe so vast, so unimaginably huge that our little planet right. and everything on it is just a tiny speck. Okay. That's the essence of the big world hypothesis. It suggests that there are likely countless other civilizations out there, many far more advanced than us. And that our existence might be statistically insignificant in the grand scheme of things. That's both awe-inspiring and a little terrifying at the same time. It's like yeah. looking up at the night sky and realizing just how small we are. Mm -hmm. But how does this connect back to the issue of meaning in utopia? That's where things get really interesting. Okay. Bostrom argues that the big world hypothesis presents a paradox. Okay. On one hand, the vastness of the universe yeah. could make our individual lives seem utterly insignificant. Right. But on the other hand, it also suggests that the potential for meaning and value is infinitely greater than we ever imagined. Okay, my mind is officially blown. Yeah. So we're both insignificant and potentially infinitely significant. It's like a cosmic riddle. How do we even begin to make sense of that? And what does it mean for how we should live our lives both in the present and in a potential utopian future? Those are questions we'll delve into in the next and final part of our deep dive. But for now, I wanna leave you with this thought. If our little planet is just one tiny speck in a vast and potentially teeming universe, yeah. what does that say about the scope of human potential? What might we be capable of achieving, both individually and collectively, right. if we can overcome the limitations of our current circumstances? Welcome back to our deep dive into deep utopia. Yeah. Oh. We've been uh, we've been exploring some pretty mind bending concepts from you know yeah, the economics of abundance mm -hmm. to the moral dilemmas of creating artificial <laughs> life. Yeah. And then there's that whole big world hypothesis, uh, the idea that our planet might just be a tiny blip in a vast. Yeah and potentially teeming universe, it's a lot to wrap your head around. It is, it is. Yeah. And it leads us to the question that's been at the heart of our discussion. Okay. How do we find meaning and purpose in a world where technology has seemingly solved all our problems? Right. Especially if, as the big world hypothesis suggests, mm -hmm. our individual lives might be statistically insignificant okay. in the grand scheme of things. Yeah, it's like we're trading one set of anxieties for another. Instead of worrying about survival, right. we're faced with the potential meaninglessness of it all. Yeah. It's enough to make you want to crawl back into bed and pull the covers over your head. Yeah. I understand the feeling. Yeah. But Bostrom doesn't leave us stranded okay. in this existential abyss. He offers some potential solutions. Okay. Ways to create meaning and purpose even in a world of abundance mm. and vast cosmic indifference. Okay. I'm all ears. All right. Give me some hope here. Okay. How do we navigate this strange new world? Well, one solution Bostrom explores is what he calls artificially engineered purpose. Okay. It might sound a bit dystopian at first. Yeah, a little bit. Like something out of a sci-fi novel where everyone's emotions are controlled by the government. Yeah, that's not exactly the utopia I signed up for. Right. But I'm guessing Bostrom has something more nuanced in mind. He does. Think about it this way. We already use all sorts of techniques to shape our desires. And motivations, right. We set goals, we create deadlines, we reward ourselves for good behavior, mm. we join clubs, we compete in sports, we even play video games, all to create challenges and give ourselves a sense of purpose. So artificially engineered purpose is just a more sophisticated version of that. Exactly. 
Bostrom suggests that we could use advanced technology like uh, uh-huh. n- like neurotechnology or carefully designed virtual environments mm-hmm. to create experiences that are inherently meaningful, okay. even if they wouldn't be so in our natural state. So instead of just popping a pill to feel happy, we could use technology to tap into uh, to tap into deeper sources of meaning and motivation. Precisely. It's not about erasing our struggles or challenges, but about creating new ones that are aligned with our values and aspirations. Imagine a virtual world where you could be a hero, an explorer, a creator, where you could face challenges and overcome obstacles that feel real and consequential, Mm. even if they exist only in the digital realm. That's a pretty intriguing idea. It's like the ultimate video game, but with real emotional stakes. And Bostrom doesn't stop there. Okay. He also emphasizes the importance of active experience over passive consumption. I can relate to that. There's mm-hmm. a big difference between, you know, mindlessly scrolling through social media right. and actually creating something, learning something new, or having a meaningful conversation. Exactly. Bostrom argues that true fulfillment comes from actively engaging with the world, from pursuing goals, creating things, building relationships, yeah. and pushing ourselves beyond our comfort zones. Mm. And he believes that utopia would provide the ideal environment for these kinds of pursuits, All right. freeing us from the constraints of scarcity and survival to fully explore our potential. So utopia wouldn't be about just lounging around in virtual reality, indulging in endless pleasure. Right. It would be about using our newfound freedom to explore, to create, to connect with others in meaningful ways. Precisely. Yeah. It's about using technology as a tool for self-discovery and growth, not as a means of escape. Mm. or distraction. Okay. And Bostrom also believes that a solved world would allow us to cultivate a deeper appreciation for beauty and aesthetics. That makes sense. When we're not struggling to survive, we have more time and energy to appreciate art, music, nature, the things that make life truly beautiful. Yes, all of that. But also the beauty of knowledge, Hmm. the elegance of mathematics, the wonder of the universe itself. Yeah. Bostrom believes that in a world without scarcity or suffering, we'd be free to explore these realms in ways that are currently unimaginable. It's like utopia would open up entirely new dimensions of experience. Right. We wouldn't just be happier. We'd be more fully human. That's a beautiful way to put it. And it brings us to one of the most important takeaways from Deep Utopia. Okay. Creating a meaningful life, it isn't something we can outsource to technology. Right. It's something we have to actively cultivate, both individually and collectively, Mm -hmm. regardless of our external circumstances. So even if we never achieve a perfect technological utopia, we can still strive to create meaning and purpose in our lives right now. Exactly. Absolutely. And Bostrom's work gives us some valuable tools and frameworks for doing just that. It challenges us to question our assumptions, to think creatively, Mm. and to be intentional about the kind of future we want to create, both for ourselves and for humanity as a whole. Well, that's a pretty empowering message. It's not often that a deep dive into a potential utopia leaves you feeling more motivated to tackle the challenges of the present. That's the power of Bostrom's work. It forces us to confront the big questions, the uncomfortable truths, and to find new ways of thinking about our place in the world. So to all of you deep divers out there, here's a final thought to ponder. Okay. If you could design your perfect day in utopia, what would it look like? Yeah. What activities would bring you the most joy, Mm -hmm. the most fulfillment, the most meaning? And what steps can you take right now? to cultivate those things in your life, even in our imperfect, unsolved world. Remember, the future isn't something that just happens to us. It's something we create through our choices, our actions, and our imaginations. And that's it for our deep dive into deep utopia. We hope you've enjoyed the journey. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share this episode with your fellow deep thinkers. Until next time, keep exploring, keep questioning, and keep diving deep.